How many of y'all here like to eat meat? I like, I like meat quite a bit. I eat it about every day. Somewhat different question, how many of y'all here actually go out and kill an animal, prepare it, and then eat it? One hand. Right. Not many of us do that nowadays, I'm somewhat thankful. It's kind of convenient, you go, to the, you go to the grocery store, you can get a bunch of chicken legs, you know, you can get God, God knows how many chicken legs for like six, six, ten bucks, right? You think about it, you buy a pack of ten chicken legs, there were five chickens that died to get you those chicken legs. If you actually went out and killed that many chickens, your perspective on the chicken you were about to eat might be somewhat different. Most of human hist- for most of human history, when you went out and ate meat, it was because you probably, you know, you killed the animal, or you knew the animal, you saw the animal. You, you, you don't think of a chicken leg as a nice little roast thing. No, you could actually, like, say, oh, yes, it's that chicken walking outside, using those legs to walk around. There's an actual living creature. When you kill an animal, you know that it's alive. You know, we don't get to see that, but generally when you kill an animal to eat an animal, you, you bleed it. It's the, it's the way the Jews were instructed to do it. It's the way Muslims do it now. And the way many of us, how many of the animals we eat are prepared. It's you cut the animal and the blood leaves the animal and the animal dies. You see the life leaving that creature. And most humans, most of our ancestors were familiar with this process of something dying. And then they would eat it. There's certainly a sense, a a sort of grim realization that whenever you eat that chicken, that, that chicken breast or you eat that hamburger, that in order for you to be eating that, something else had to die. And the blood that came out of that animal is virtually indistinguishable from your own. Without modern technology, it's, for all we can tell, it's the same stuff. It's no surprise to me that in the Old Testament, when the the predominant sacrifice offered by man was the animal, just as they had to kill these animals and then eat these animals in order to not die here, not starve to death, you now were offering up the best animal, the finest animal, the animal that in theory would have been the best for eating. You're offering that up so that you can live not with this body, but with the next. If you think about it, it's a, similar, a similar perspective can be gleaned from what would normally be up here ahead of me on a, on a Sunday morning. There would be plates with bread and there would be wine. Similar, nowadays we don't, when you, when you can eat meat without having seen all of the horrible things that really go into it. The fact that there is death. You are sustained constantly every day by death. Well, every week we commemorate that we live eternally because of death. Just as much as you have the same blood that went, flowed out of Jesus, that's, that's similar material that flows through us. You pierce, pierce your side, there will be blood coming out of you as well. Aside from perhaps gaining a little bit of a somberness whenever you eat your next meal, There's a 
good reality, and I think it's good to reflect on it because we're so removed from the process, that, yeah, most, most humans, in one way or another, we're, we are survive on the death of some other being, be it the animals that feed us, be it the soldiers, revolutionaries, and, and uh, visionaries who sacrificed their lives to put us where we are now. And of course, Jesus Christ and the apostles, all of whom one way, most of, well, most of the apostles and Jesus Christ absolutely died so that one way or another we come to knowing the word and we can be saved. It's not a, it's a somewhat bloody message, message, but it's not a particularly complicated one. In the case of Christ, well, in the case of an animal, you can choose not to eat animals. That's the thing you can do. If it offends you, if you had to kill, if you had to kill an animal every time you ate meat, you might be a little bit more apprehensive of eating meat on a regular basis. You need to survive, so you might get over it, but it would give you pause for thought. You don't actually have that choice when it comes to Christ, if you think about it. Christ died for every man. You're not actually, you're not exempt from that. You can opt out, per se. You can say, I will choose to die, but he still died for you. He was the creator of the world. He was there when everything was made. He still died for you. And that blood is, if you're a Christian, it's that blood that you wear, that death that you're buried into when you were baptized. It's always with you. And, of course, Jesus is special. Unlike the sacrifice of animals, Jesus rose from the dead. No man, no man was pure enough to do such a thing. No, no animal could cleanse you the same way Jesus did. If you're a Christian, hopefully something to think about, something to remember, something to put, put life in perspective. If you're not a Christian, though, the invitation is always there. There's no circumstance under which you can say, I don't need what Christ did for me. He's already done it, and his hand is already extended. His blood was already shed, and he rose from the dead, and he lives. You can choose to live and accept that reality, or you can, as most of us do regarding meat, we can live in blissful ignorance about what perpetuates our life. I would suggest, however, that accepting the reality of Christ's death is far better than willful ignorance. If this invitation has any meaning to you, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.